We just want to, I, I just wanted to ask Anne if, if she would pray for Gwen so that she just feels at home, and then she's going to share her testimony. So let's just, Anne, if okay. you would, please. Sure. Just pray for Gwen. You know the slack there, Pastor. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Lord, this is a precious jewel standing next to me that you have redeemed, that you have reconciled, and I'm so grateful. And I ask, Lord, that what she shares is so powerful and precious to you and that it will bless your heart as she speaks. And I ask, Lord, that she give, give uh, Gwen holy boldness and uh, courage. And I know what she's going to share is powerful, and it's going to touch everybody in this building and beyond. And I just thank you for her in Jesus' name. Amen. Can people hear me? Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, the real reason I actually came to give my testimony today is so that I didn't have to wear a mask for a couple minutes. Um, you don't get that a lot these days. Um, um, so just to start off, um, if any of you guys have a Bible with you, um, there is a really good verse that you could feel free to open it up to. Um, it's Romans 5, 3 through 5. So, um, and I will read it also at the end. But it's, it's a verse that I found recently that just really kind of speaks to me, um, just with my life and all of that. So just feel free to keep an eye on that. <laughs> um, so I guess to start off, uh, I was raised in a Christian family. Um, my mom was raised Lutheran, my dad was raised Catholic, but he converted to Lutheranism right before my oldest brother was born um, because he had really thought about it and he wanted all of us kids to grow up in the same, a united household, like a united you know, front and stuff. Um, I grew up in a really small town, uh, Howard Lake, Minnesota. I don't know if any of you, oh, okay, a couple. Um, most people are like, where's that? But yeah, like ways away from here, 30 minutes, I don't know. But um, I grew up with three brothers, no sisters. It was really hard sometimes. <laughs> um, I had to teach myself how to do all the girly stuff, so it was, it was hard. Um, my family grew up like going to church a lot. Um, we went every single Sunday. If we couldn't go on Sunday, we went on the Wednesday night service. Um, I... Every single year that I was in grade school, I actually won the award for perfect church attendance. Every single year. <laughs> Ten years. So even in the summertime, like, we were committed. Um, so on the outside, you know, you see a family like that. Like, we looked really normal, especially at church. We, we all sat up straight. You know, we, we sang. We listened. We looked really good. We looked so good that I don't think you'd be able to know the darkness that was really in our home. Um, my father was an alcoholic when I was growing up. Um, he started drinking when he was very young. I think he was about 14. Um, and by the time he had all of us kids, he was very established in that addiction. Um, I, I remember, you know, especially my early childhood life, it was really hard. Um, I would go home every day just terrified um, of how my dad would act. I, I didn't know if we were going to have a good night or if, he, if something was going to set him off. And he, was, he would start yelling. He would, sometimes things got broken. Um, I, a common reoccurring thing was sometimes he would get so mad that he would go pack a suitcase and he would just leave. And... We didn't have cell phones then, so we didn't know where he was going. I just would watch him leave, and I was terrified. I didn't know if my dad was coming back. Um, so it was really hard. And, you know, my mom, she really did her best um, to try and help us kids through it. And at the same time, we didn't really talk about it. It, it was just such a taboo topic that it was... I think at the time it felt easier to just kind of sweep it under the rug and just say, 
someday it'll get better. Someday it won't be like this, but we're not going to talk about it because it's too painful. So, you know, at home was really hard. Um, most kids that grow up kind of in a hard home lifestyle, they love to be out of the house. They love to be away from home because that's when they have peace. That's when they have security and safety. I didn't really have that either. Um, I would go to school and I got picked on really bad. I, I didn't have a single friend all through grade school. Um, the, the closest person that I could call my friend was a neighbor and she was probably one of the worst people that picked on me. Um, just really, really awful things. So I would go to school with just so much anger from living at home and not being able to get my work, my story out, not being able to say, I'm really upset with how my life is right now. And I would, I just prayed and wished so hard that somebody would notice at school and say, do you want to talk about it? But that didn't really happen. Um, the kids all picked on me. They called me a monster. They called me ugly. They called me anything they could think of to bring me down. They called me it. And then when I would get angry and retaliate, my teachers would come and punish me. They wouldn't say, why are you so angry? What's, what's going on? They wouldn't say anything like that. They would basically, in a nutshell, say, Gwen is really bad. Gwen's a problem child. Gwen needs to be silenced, and we can't listen to her. So, and then I would go back home and have another rough night with my parents. And then I would go to school and do it all over again. And that was my cycle for 10 years, kindergarten, preschool through eighth grade. Um, and then when I was in sixth grade, something really big happened. Um, I had come home one day. I think I was hanging out with the neighbor kids or something. And I walked inside and I saw my mom sitting at the kitchen table. And she had a bunch of papers around her and she just looked super stressed. So I was like, what's wrong? What's going on? And she, she didn't even look up at me. Like she was just, she was hurting. She was so stressed out. She didn't even look at me. And she just said, dad got another DUI. He's in jail. And I don't know if we can afford to get him out. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that sucks. So, you know, I'm just a sixth grader. I was like, okay, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to go to my room. So, and like, so I went to my room, and as I was on my way, I grabbed our landline. Some of you kids might not know what a landline is, but it's a phone that stays in your house. So I grabbed that, and I went to my bedroom. And I just sat there for a minute holding it like, I need to talk to somebody. Who, who do I have to talk to? Um, at that point, my two older brothers, so I have two older brothers, one younger. My two older brothers were both away at college. One was in college. I think one had graduated. But so I grabbed the phone and I called the only person whose number I had memorized because this was a landline. We didn't, we couldn't just save contacts, you know. So I called my brother Jake and he answered. And this was about probably nine o'clock at night, something like that. So I called my brother Jake and he answered. And I started to say, I was like, mom just told me that dad's in jail and we can't afford to get him out. And then as soon as I said that, my bedroom door flew open. My mom comes in. She goes, what are you doing? And she grabs, my, she grabs the phone. She leaves. She shuts the door. Suddenly, I didn't have anybody to talk to. And it was taken just like that. I was so angry. I was, I was livid. And I just, I screamed at God that night. I sat in my room, I punched my bed, I punched the wall, I punched the door. I was so angry. And I said, God, why? Why are you doing this to me? Why did you make my life this way? You know, I've spent, I went to a Christian school, so I said, I've spent all of these years listening to how good you are, how you love your people, how if we pray, you're going to take care of us. Why aren't you taking care of me and my family? I said, what did we do wrong? So I just sat there and I said, you're not real. God's not real. And I said, if you are real, you hate me and my family. And I firmly believe that. And out loud, I remember saying, from this point on, I don't believe in God. I don't. 
there's nothing in my life has made me think that you are real, so I don't believe in you. It was a really rough night. Fast forward two years, I started high school. Now, all through grade school, you know, I was getting picked on and stuff, and one thing that my mom said to me all the time is she would say, just wait until you get to high school. You're going to go to a different high school 30 minutes away from here. You're going to meet all new people. You're going to make all new friends. You will make friends. <laughs> um, but she's like, it'll be so good. Just hold on until you get to that point. Just hold on. So I would come home and have a bad day, and I was like, oh, high school is going to be great. I can't wait for high school. You know, this magical land of high school where everything is great. And then I started high school. And I realized high school is hard. High school is even harder than middle school. But some good things did happen. I met some really good friends. Um, I met my best friend, Laura. And I met my best friend, Colin. And eight years later, they're still my best friends. And they are both so so faithful. They just both really believed in God. And I think that God put them, I didn't know it at the time, but I think God put them in my life as angels. Because he knew that I was right on the edge and I was about, I was right on the edge. So he put them there to push me back a little bit. And I really needed them. I desperately needed them. So I'm, I'm so grateful that I got them. Um, so that's something really good that came out of high school. Something really bad that came out of high school is high school boys. They're not awesome. Um, <laughs> you often hear people say that high school boys only think about one thing. It's true. A lot of them told me that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I got to high school and then suddenly, not only did I suddenly have friends, but I suddenly had boys that were interested in me. And I was like, what, really? But they were only interested in that one thing. And so I would have boys talk to me at night, try and expect not good things out of me. And then the next day I would go to school and these boys wouldn't even look at me. And my school had less than 200 people in it. So to not look at somebody all day required serious effort, like serious effort. <laughs> um, so that was really frustrating. And that, that kind of added to my belief that I'd been stirring my whole life that people don't really care about me. They don't really care about like the soul of who I am. They only want to see what's the outside, you know. So in high school, that's when my depression and anxiety just came to, the, it hit its peak, you know. <clears throat> when I was a sophomore in high school, I started self-harming. Um, and I loved it. I, I, had I felt like I really had nothing else um, to kind of give me solace. But then I found that. And I was like, I, I became addicted to it. It's, it was like a drug for me. And so that's how I went through the rest of my sophomore year, the rest of my junior year. Um, my friends found out about it, and they were at a loss. They didn't know what to do. They, they were like, oh. This is really not good. This girl is really suffering. So they really tried the best that they could to be there for me. And, you know, I'm sure some of you are sitting there just, you can't even fathom it. Like, how could somebody do that to themselves? And I'm sure that's what they thought too. So they did the best they could. And it was hard. Um, when junior year started, you know, it was kind of hard. Um, I ended up going to an outpatient therapy program for about a month and a half. Um, and that really helped. I started doing really good in there. I started excelling, you know. And, and then when I got done with that, then I started attending high school again full time. Because while I was in the outpatient thing, I did school there. So I just went to a hospital basically every day for a month and a half. <clears throat> and then I got out. And suddenly my grades improved a little bit. You know, I was a little happier, all of this stuff. And then I met somebody that showed me drugs. And I was like, I just remember the first time I ever smoked marijuana, I was like, oh, yeah, this, 
this really takes the edge off. You know, this is, this is great. Now I really don't have to think about my life. I can just get stoned all the time. And, but I didn't really give up the self-harm either. I just kind of added on one more thing that I could destroy myself with. Because I really, you know, I went to a Lutheran high school, but I still hadn't really found God again. I did all the classes, I did all that stuff, and I still kind of had that thought, God's real for all of you guys, but he's not real for me. He doesn't love me. He loves you, he loves you, but he doesn't love me. So, whatever. Um, but, so when I started smoking pot, I was like, cool. Um, and then I started meeting peop other people that smoke pot. And I'm not saying all drug addicts are bad, all alcoholics are bad, anything like that, because it's not true. I've met some really wonderful, ple wonderful people that do that. And most of them are broken too. So, you know, you hear people say, if you want a positive life, if you want good stuff, you need to surround yourself with positive people. Well, I was surrounding myself with other broken people. And I was in turn just getting more broken. Um, I got into a really bad relationship. Um, my first relationship, so I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. We're gonna marry each other, it's gonna be great. Not realizing that I'm 16 and you know, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, but I got into this relationship, it ended up not working. I was crushed, got into another bad relationship right after that, didn't work out, I was crushed. And again, all of this stuff is just feeding into the fact that I just suck. You know, nobody sucks as much as me. And, but so that whole summer, just got into bad relationships, just kept doing drugs, kept self-harming. That was, that was my new cycle, you know? And then senior year started. And when senior year started, that's, senior year was bad. It was really bad. Um, at the end of September of my senior year of high school, so it was 2015, I attempted suicide. Um, and it was late at night. It was the night of my high school homecoming, my senior year homecoming. I didn't go to it. Instead, I went home, got high, tried to kill myself. And uh, it was really late at night. I, I had I don't really remember, but what I've been told is that I was sending my friend pictures of hurting myself, trying to kill myself. And sh thankfully she ended up calling the police and sending an ambulance to my house. Um, but I just remember my, I can't even think of how my parents felt when they suddenly woke up at about 10 p.m. to an ambulance in their driveway to their daughter being bandaged up and then being like, oh, we have to go to the hospital now because our daughter's trying to kill herself. It was a very dark time, it really was. Um, and then when I was at the hospital, I was a minor, so they drug tested me, found out I was doing weed. I was a minor, so they told my parents. That wasn't good. I was like, come on guys. And I remember being so angry that my parents found out that I smoke now because I was like, oh, they're gonna take away my coping mechanism. Why? I need this. But yeah, I ended up being put in inpatient for I think about a week. Um, so I was an inpatient. I think I had like one family, family therapy session, but there was just so much going on in my life that one therapy session didn't do much. I needed about 100. Um, but I got released from the hospital. I went home, my mom picked me up. On my way home, I did not want to go home so badly that I tried to jump out of the car on the freeway. I was just done. I was like, I'm not going back there. And then when I got home, I attempted suicide again. And my mom's face, when she found out that I tried it again, I will never get that image out of my head. I had never seen my mom look so scared. And we grew up with a really bad life, so we saw a bunch of scary things. But I had never seen her look that scared. 
and I felt so bad. I called 911, brought me to the hospital again. There was a woman there that was talking to me, and she was like, do you feel safe? You know, do you feel safe? Are you able to go home? Do you feel like you're suicidal anymore? And I was like, nope. Because I was like, I'm not going back to inpatient. So I was like, no, I feel great. Just, yeah, send me home. It'll be fine. I have a stash of weed at home. It'll be fine. I'll be good. That was a really, really low point. And it was about to get lower. <laughs> Two weeks after I got released from the hospital, my dad was arrested for drinking and driving again. I blame myself. I blame myself hard. <laughs> I thought what I did was so stressful that my dad, I drove my dad to go drink. So I started self-harming more, started doing more drugs, because now I had this to cope with. It's like, this is my fault. I can't even, I can't even kill myself and have it work out. That's really how I felt. I was also, I felt really guilty and I was also pissed at my dad. Can I say pissed in a church? I was very, very angry <laughs> at my dad. And uh, so he was in jail and my mom at this point, she was like, I'm not doing this anymore. So she told him, I'm not, pay I'm not bailing you out. She said, if you, if you wanna get out, you can come up with your own money and do it. And I was super, I was super angry and resentful. I was like, yeah, who cares? Um, and then my dad did make bail a couple weeks later. And I remember my mom coming and talking to me. And she was like, well, he needs a place to be released home to. Do you want him here? And I was like, no. I get to choose if I want him here. I don't want him here. And my little brother was also still living at home. She asked him too, and we were like, mm -mm. we don't want him here. Nope. And so my mom's like, okay. So he moved in with a neighbor for a little while. And uh, that's where he lived for about two months while he was doing, while he was going to court dates, hearing his sentencing and all that. And my mom would ask me, my mom would still go see him sometimes at our neighbor's house. It was kind of cute. They went and had little date nights in my neighbor's basement. That's what love is. You love each other through the good and the bad. But um, so they would have little date nights and stuff. And sometimes my mom would be like, you want to come, you want to come with? And I was like, absolutely not. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> and then my dad's sentencing date came around. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, but from my memory, um, my dad was facing at least a couple years in jail, or he could do a 13 month treatment program at some kind of inpatient treatment place. So he was left with this decision. Do you know what he picked? At first he said, I'll just go to jail. Alcoholism had that much of a hold on him that when he was offered a chance to not go to jail, he was like, I'd rather just go to jail. That sounds easier. Sounds easier than having to deal with my problems. And when I heard that he said that, I was like, Um, thankfully though, my mom talked to him. She was like, no, you need to go to treatment. <laughs> That's how you're going to get your family back. That's how you're going to get your life back. You gotta go to treatment. So my dad was like, fine, I'll go, but I'm not going to like it. And he kind of did go that way. He was kicking and screaming. He did not want to go to treatment. I mean, I've been, to, I've been impatient looking back. I don't blame him. You have to live with a bunch of people that you don't know. You don't get to control when you go outside. You have to give up a lot of control. It's not fun. <laughs> it's really hard. So looking back, I don't think I would have wanted to go either. But he did. And I remember when we were first figuring out where to, when my mom was first figuring out where he should go, we heard about Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. And so my mom was like, okay. So she was researching that. And she 
looked it up, and she was like, okay, they offer financial assistance. So she was like, if I'm going to write to the financial assistance people, and if they can at least give us, like, half, if they can pay for half of it, then we can do it. Because remember, I was in and out of the hospital right now, too. I had a therapist. She had two kids living at home. My mom was just a teacher. She didn't make a lot of money. And now she, my dad had to go to treatment, so she was like, oh, if I could just get half of it covered, I'll, I'll figure out the rest. We'll figure out the rest. But half of it would be just such a blessing. And my mom's prayed a lot, a lot. She's, she prays constantly. So she prayed about this. She said, God, please, please, just pay for half of it. I, it'll be hard, but we can figure out the rest of it. And then one day she got an email back, and they said that they were going to pay for all of it, the whole cost. And I remember my mom, I'm pretty sure she started crying. She was like, I wasn't expecting this. That's how much, I think that's how much God really wanted my dad to be there in that place. That's how much he really wanted him to get better. He was like, I'll take care of it. You just focus on getting better. And that was really cool for me to hear. And at the same time, I was like, it's not going to matter. He'll be clean for 13 months. He'll get out. He'll drink again. I had no faith. <laughs> None. So I was like, we've been, around, we've been through this before. A couple times. We've been through this. And it hasn't really worked. So I was like, whatever. Okay. Sure. So my dad went into treatment. Um, the end of January, he, he went in the day after one of my nieces was born. So right before he went in, he got to see a picture of my niece. And he got to hear about her being born. So was, he liked that. I think that helped him a little bit. Um, so he went into treatment. And I'm, I think for the first, at least the first month, maybe even the first two, he couldn't have visitors. Um, so like, that was easy for me. I was like, great, I don't have to think about visiting him. I can't go there anyway. Um, but I'm sure it was really, really hard for him. You know, he's in this place, he doesn't want to be. Now he can't even see his family at all. Yikes. <laughs> that sounds scary. Um, and then finally, he was able to have visitors every Saturday. And my mom, every Saturday. You know, we lived about an hour outside of Minneapolis. Every Saturday, my mom would drive all the way out there and go sit with him for like two or three hours, and she would drive home every Saturday. And every Saturday, she would ask, you want to come with? And I said, nope. <laughs> nope. Next Saturday, do you want to come with? Nope. Next Saturday, you want to come with? <laughs> Mom, I said no the last two weeks. I don't want to go, okay? Stop asking. But then there was one day after my dad had been in there for a good, a good while, a couple, four or five months, something like that. And it was a Thursday night, I believe. It was some kind of like special family day where you heard a speaker or something like that. And my mom was like, come on, just go to this one. You know, it's for families. It's not a visiting day just for anybody. This is a family thing. You're still his family. Come on. And she was like, he's only been there a little while, but I'm starting to really see a change, Gwen. I really am. And I was like, you're biased. You're his wife. You have to say that. She was like, oh, I didn't want to go. So then my mom was like, well, don't go for dad. Go for yourself. She's like, maybe there's something that you need to hear from the person that's going to be there. She's like, go for yourself then. And I was like, fine, fine, fine. If it'll get you off my back, I'll go. So I went. And I remember walking in and seeing my dad. And I remember looking at him. And the word gentle came to mind. He looked gentle. In all the years that I have been alive, I have never used gentle as a word to describe my dad, ever. Angry, bitter, resentful, things synonymous with that. Yes, <laughs> I've used it a lot. But gentle, that, that never made sense. But that day he looked gentle. His eyes looked softer. He, 
he looked so frail that I thought, maybe, maybe there is hope here, just a tiny bit. I didn't, I didn't completely sway. It wasn't like, I was just like, oh, he looks a lot better. Yes, this is going to be great. I didn't think that. I still had a lot of doubt, but I thought, maybe, maybe it'll get better. We'll see. A little shred of hope. So, and this was all while I was a senior. My dad was in treatment for most of my senior year. Um, I had my senior prom. My dad wasn't able to make it, but I still really wanted him to see me in my dress. So taking that little shred of hope of thinking that he was different, I was like, okay, I'll do something for him. So I went there, right I got up bright and early so that I could get dressed, I could get all pretty, and beautify. Um, and then I drove out to Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge, full prom get up, it was in my dress. I had a big poofy dress too, it barely fit in my car, but I drove there. <laughs> Uh, and it was on a Saturday, too, so it was a visiting day. So I walked inside, and I was like, I want to see my dad. And I'm pretty sure that my dad said that he thought it was my mom that was there to see him. And he was like, oh, wow, she's early. And then he walked out, and he saw me, and I was like, I needed my dad to see me on my senior prom. You're still my dad. I needed you. We got pictures together, and I love those pictures. I do. Um, so there was that, um, and then, and then I, it came time for me to graduate, and there was a lot of fear there about if they were going to let my dad out to see me walk, if he was going to be able to see me graduate high school. For a while, we didn't know, and that sparked up a lot of anger again, so I was like, come on, Dad, it's my senior year of high school, and I'm your only daughter, and now you might not even be able to see me graduate. And I was just like, ugh, ugh, mm, mm, mm. I'm mad. I was very upset. Started smoking again. Well, I'd been smoking this whole time. Who am I kidding? But, <laughs> um, so, but, you know, it just kind of drove that thought again. Like, I'm super mad. I need to cope with it by hurting myself. So it was hard, but he did get to see me graduate high school. I'm so grateful for that. I mean, it was God. God, God was working there. He knew that me and my me and my dad needed this. Like, if my dad wouldn't have been able to be there, it would have drove us further apart. I know it. And God was like, No, they need to get closer together. If they go any farther apart, they're going to be on different continents. Like, we need to bring them closer. So he did get to see me graduate. That was awesome. Very, very thankful for that. Um, and then he went back, and then the summer happened. And that summer, I got into a new relationship with a broken person, did a lot of drugs. And so all summer, I would go hang out with friends, we'd smoke, do all this. It was great, it was a good time. Not really, don't do drugs. It wasn't worth it, but it felt like a good time. Um, and I just, I just really started changing as a person. Like, I was already different, but I started changing even more. Started being more reckless. Um, right when the summer was about to end, um, it was right after my birthday, it was an August birthday. Summer babies, woo, we're the best. Um, <laughs> um, but it was right after my birthday and I had overheard my mom talking about how we were kind of struggling with money a little bit. And I was like, well, I want to help. You know, I'm 18 now. I can help. And before that, I had like little part-time jobs, but didn't really make a ton of money. Um, so I was like, I want to help. I need to help in a big way. So I found this modeling ad online. And, you know, I was like, constantly high, so I didn't see any red flags in this, but so I found this modeling ad and drove out to Hastings because I was going to do this modeling gig to make a couple quick bucks. I was raped. Um, and it was very scary. It was very hard. It, it was a horrible time. And I had to call my mom that night and I had to say, hey, 
I'm going to be at the hospital in Hastings for a while. I got raped. My poor mother, first of all, my poor mother, she has been through a lot. She has listened to a lot. Um, sorry, Mom. <laughs> um, but she was like, what can I do? And I was like, oh. she was like, well, I'm going I'm to pray. You know, like I said, my mom prayed a lot. So she just said, I'm going to pray. And she sat awake all night until I got home. I think it was like 5 in the morning. She just sat awake all night praying. Nobody will ever love you as much as your mom. Just saying. Maybe your dad. Maybe God. <laughs> but a mom is really special. And oh my gosh. So... That really hurt me. Um, that was probably one of the lowest points of my life. So after that, I didn't, I didn't really think a lot of stuff was worth it. Um, I got, ended up leaving the current boyfriend I was with and immediately rebounded into another horrible relationship. We did it. High school was great. I picked winners. Um, got into another horrible la relationship. This, this person needed money. I figured, I'm already a terrible person. <laughs> Look what I did. Look what happened to me. So I started prostituting myself for this person. I was barely 18 years old. It was awful. But this person I was with broke me down so much that he made me think, you need to do this. You're not worth anything better. And then one day I came and gave him a bunch of money and a normal boyfriend would be like, what are you doing? What are you doing to yourself? This is insane. He looked at the money and he looked at me and he said, well, just be careful. Just be careful. Hope you don't get kidnapped. <laughs> oh. So yeah, I wasn't in a good place. Um, Eventually, I ended up leaving that boyfriend. Um, God put somebody in my life that gave me the courage to leave him. Um, without that person, I would probably still be with him, and I would not be standing up here today. I can tell you that. I would not. <laughs> so left this person, and right around the time that I left this person, my dad got out of treatment. And so he came home, and my mom had to say, do you know what your daughter has been doing? No, she's a mess. She probably didn't use those words. Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't there. But she had to tell my dad. And remember, the whole time my dad was in treatment, I was like, he's not going to get any better. He's not going to be any different. Well, I was wrong. He was so different when he got out that they kicked me out. And I was like, ah, ah, you are going to kick me out? I'm your daughter. I'm like, look at all the stuff Dad's been doing. You didn't kick him out. I'm like, this isn't fair. So I was mad. I was super mad. But my dad had learned in treatment that you can't enable that behavior. So he was like, so they both decided. They were like, we need to ask her to leave. And it wasn't easy for my parents, you know. Not only am I their child, but like I'm their only daughter. I was doing really, really bad things. I was putting my life in danger every single day. They didn't know if when they kicked me out, I was gonna get better or if I was gonna get worse. They didn't know. They left it in God's hands. And for a while, I was really mad, I was really angry. I didn't talk to them for a good, for a good time, a couple months. Y'all are mean, but eventually um, I started going back to my therapist who had been with in high school. Kind of stopped seeing her when I was with a really, really bad guy, but started going back to see her. Started in a group therapy thing. Kind of started getting a little confidence. Stopped doing some of those things. Still doing drugs, <laughs> but stopped prostituting, stopped self-harming. I was in a little bit better place that I called my parents one day and I was talking to them and I was like, 
Thank you. Thank you for kicking me out. I didn't realize it at the time, but I needed that. If I would have stayed there, I would have continued doing those bad things, but I needed, I needed a reality check, and I needed to learn to do better. So I said, thank you. I'm not mad at you guys anymore. Thank you. And that was really important. Um, so we started talking again, you know, started talking to my mom, started talking a little more to my dad. A couple years, about a year goes by, and I ended up moving to a different place in Eden Prairie. Um, lived there for a little while. Eventually, my little brother came and moved in with me so he could go to college at Normandale. So me and my little brother were roomies, you know. It was interesting. Little brothers are annoying, but I'm sure that if he was up here, he would say big sisters are annoying. So it was interesting. <laughs> but it was, it was good. Um, and then one more thing happened to me. Trust me, it gets better soon. It does, I swear. Um, but there was one day that I was driving around with a couple friends. We were smoking weed. You know, of course, that's what I did. So we were smoking weed. And I got pulled over by a cop. And I didn't know that these friends had dab cartridges on them. And for those of you that don't know, dabs or wax are like, more highly concentrated form of weed, and like just a drop of it is an automatic felony if you're found with it, like a drop. It's very serious. And these guys had them in their car, in my car, and I didn't know about it, so I was pulled over. Um, I had had a beer before I was driving, and I was only 20 at the time, so it was only one beer, but I was, I was not legal. Um, so the cop pulled me out, he was talking to me, while I was out of the car, these guys stashed those dab cartridges in my car. And then the cop was gonna let me go. You know, I had told him everything. I told him that there was weed in the car, so that's what I knew about. I was owning up to it. So I was like, there's weed in the car, just take it, please. Just, I'll do better, just take it. So he was like, okay, I'll let you go. And then he went to search my car. He found the dabs. And he turned around and he said, this is a different story, you're under arrest. And I was like, <laughs> okay, okay. That is the scariest point of my life. That was the worst night of my life. It, all the other things that I had been through did not compare to that night. Jail is awful. <laughs> and I usually pride myself on being a pretty tough chick, but I was broken in there. I, I cried all night, all night long. And you know, when you're in jail, you get a phone call. Well, they told me I could have as many phone calls as I want, but I didn't call anybody because I was so ashamed and I thought my parents are gonna hate me. My parents are gonna kill me. You know, I'm in jail. I knew not to trust those people. I know not to do drugs. I knew all this stuff and I still messed up and now I'm in jail. So I was like, I can't talk to my parents. Mm -mm. So all night long, I just, I was in there alone. It was in the past. I talked to my mom because I didn't really feel safe. I talked to my dad for obvious reasons. I didn't really feel safe or confident talking to him. So when I got out and I got my cell phone back, the first person I called wasn't my mom. It was my dad. That's a really weird thing, <laughs> especially in my life. That was really weird. I called my dad. And... I told him, I just got out of jail, got arrested for drugs. And he said, yeah, I figured that when you didn't respond. He's been through this before, he knew, <laughs> he knew. So he was like, yeah, I figured. Do you need me to come see you? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I do. And Eden Prairie is still 50, 55 minutes away from where my parents live. My dad got in his car. He drove out to me. And I remember he got to my apartment 
And the whole time he was on his way there, I was like, he is going to rip into me. He is going to yell at me, you know, all these things. I was like, he's going to tell me that I am the worst daughter he has ever had. You know, like just, I was, my anxiety was filling my head with all this stuff. Like, oh, I'm so scared. Oh, I don't want him to come, but I do want him to come, but I don't want him to come. So then when he got there, I walked downstairs to let him in. I was shaking. I was shaking so bad. So I was like, oh, gosh. And I let him in, and he didn't say a word. We just, we just walked upstairs to my apartment. I made some coffee. I love coffee. always need coffee. Um, that's why me and Ann met at Dunn Brothers. Always need coffee. <laughs> um, so he came upstairs with me. We had some coffee. And I remember we sat at my table, and I was quiet for a little bit, too. And he was quiet, because I was just like, any second now, he's going to lay into me. Any second. But he just waited until I was ready to talk. And I told him what happened, and he didn't yell. He didn't yell at all. He looked at me, and he said, I'm disappointed, and I love you. There's nothing that you can do that will make me ever not love you. He said, you're my daughter. You're the only one I've got. I'm always going to love you, no matter what. And I was so blown away by that. Because when my dad was in that same position, I did not respond with love. For a long time, I just responded with hate. And my dad just immediately responded with love. And it was so amazing. And then he told me, you need, help. You need some help, honey. I was like, yeah, you might be right. <laughs> Maybe. So he said, you need to get connected. He's like, you need to start going to church. I was like, well, it's a little early to be talking about that, right? Church. <laughs> no. But he's like, you need, you need to start going to church. You need to start praying to God, you know, this stuff. I was like, I was like okay, Dad. Maybe. <laughs> so they went through the summer with me. They were right by me. Anything I needed, they were there to support me. And then I got my sentencing, and we were all praying a lot. And the judge ended up saying, I'm going to drop all the charges, except for the misdemeanor for the weed that I admitted to. So he's like, I'm going to drop all the charges, except for this. But if you get through a year of probation, I'll drop that too. And I was like, I think we were all shocked. We were like, what? <laughs> really? Oh, whoa. So that was amazing. So we got through that. A couple months later, I was really having a really hard day. I couldn't use drugs or anything anymore to cope with this, and I'd given up self-harm. I'm gonna be three years clean from self-harm in October. So I was like, so I was like, whew. I was, I was having a really hard day one day, and I, I live in Eden Prairie, so I remember sitting there thinking, the men's choir at Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge sang at Grace Church one time. Maybe I can go there. We went there to listen to my dad, so I was like, Maybe they're nice. They seemed nice that day. So I was like, mm -hmm. maybe I can go there. And I went there. And the pastor there started talking to me. And he was like, what are you doing Tuesday nights? And I wasn't working at the time. He was like, what are you doing Tuesday nights? And I was like, uh, nothing. Something? I don't know. Depends on what you ask next. Um, so he was like, we have this young adult church group that I think you could really benefit from. And I was like, Okay. Now, the day I went there was Monday. So the church group was the very next day. So I didn't have a lot of time to like work up the courage for this. So I was like, okay. And he was like, yeah, there's this one girl, Laura. I'll tell her to wait for you. So I was like, well, now I have to go. This girl's going to be expecting me. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went there, terrified. I had to call my best friend, Colin, on the way so that I didn't back out and go home. So I was talking to him the whole way, and I was like, I have to go to this, I have to go to this, I don't want to, I have to, I don't want to, I'm gonna. I got there, and I met some women, 
Two of them are, well, one of them was here that, was there that night. The other one kind of got into our group a little after, not too much after, a little after. And I met the girl who was supposed to be waiting for me. And the night that I went there was testimony night. <laughs> I think God has a sense of humor. I really do. <laughs> so we had to split up into small groups. And we split into small groups. And what we were supposed to do was we were supposed to share our testimonies with the people in our small group. And I was like, no, yes, I don't know. But I just remember me and this group of women, we went and sat on the port, on, the, on this pastor's front, front porch. And something happened in my heart that I just spilled everything to these women that I did not know. I, just spilled, I was bawling. I spilled everything. And when I was done, I was like, they're going to ask me to leave. They're going to be like, this chick is insane. She needs to go. But they didn't. They prayed for me. They all put their hand on me and they prayed for me. And one of the ladies, she was like, you know, you're already forgiven for all of the stuff that you did, right? And I was like, no. <laughs> she was like, you are. You're forgiven. She was like, do you believe that you're forgiven? And I was like, maybe. I don't know. And they prayed for me, and I had, I had told them about the night that I renounced God, basically. And she was like, do you want to let God back into your heart? And I was like, I think I'm ready. So we all said there. And she asked, do you accept Jesus into your life? Do you give your life to God? And I said, yes. You know, I was crying. I was like, yes, I do. And I gave myself back to God that night. And what I want to close with tonight, or t this morning, what day is it? <laughs> as far as I know, it's still January. I don't know. Quarantine's been hard on all of us, guys. Um, but what I want to leave you guys with is that the past year has not been easy. Like, there's been some really hard things. There has. I'm not standing up here saying, as soon as you accept God into your life, your life's going to be great. It's kind of hard still. You know, it is hard. But I will tell you that when my dad accepted God into his heart, and when I saw that he accepted God into his heart, and when I said, if he can do it after 40-some years, I can do it after about five, when all of those things lined up, It helped. I went, I went from having two fathers that I couldn't stand, <laughs> I couldn't stand them, to now I have two fathers that I have a really intimate and close relationship with. So I want my dad to come up here really quick. <laughs> so, My dad was kind of the one that he hurt me before, and he was the one that helped bring me back. And that just shows that God works in crazy ways. I love hanging out with my dad now, guys. We go fishing all the time. <laughs> and that is God. Thank you. Could we also have the praying mom come up here too, please? Some of the most courageous people I've ever seen. Yeah. And um, Gwen said, if you have your Bibles, open them to Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. I did say that. And I know those verses very, very well. And it says in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, not only so, but we rejoice in our suffering, 
knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and that hope does not disappoint us because he gives us his Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's done with your life. And she's never given her testimony before? Wow. Wow. The same, the same Lord that has blessed your family and filled you guys and brought you to a faith in Jesus and, and healed you um, is, is in you also. And you are all treasures as Gwen is a treasure. And the encouragement is that you realize how much God loves each and every one of you and will use you in, in amazing ways. He'll use your suffering. He'll use your mistakes. My father died last year in November, alcoholic. My sister died in September, five weeks before he died, a heroin addict. My stepfather died at 62 as an alcoholic, never recovered. So for you to be healed, I've been sober for 18 years. And God has healed me. And God, God will heal. And God can heal. God, God is more powerful. It says the lightness is more powerful than the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it.